There are four general types of seismic waves that are produced by earthquakes. These waves can be detected at great distances from the focal point of the event. By working out what time these waves arrive at a series of monitoring stations around the world, it's possible fairly precisely to work out the origin of the earthquake by a form of triangulation. However, there is even further than that, since some of these waves can travel to the other side of the globe, the really big earthquakes and bounce back and forth around the world as if ringing the earth like a giant bell. This means because these waves travel at different speeds through materials of different densities, we can predict what the earth is actually made of, even at depths we never be able to drill them down to in reality. Four main types of waves known as Raleigh waves, named after Lord Raleigh, Love waves, named after Augustus Loves, and secondary waves, sometimes called S waves, and primary waves, sometimes called P waves. Going in the order of speed of the various waves, we really need to start with the P waves. These waves travel faster than the other waves, generally result in the first indication that an earthquake is actually happening. A P wave is a compression wave, one particle pushing the one next to it, transmitting the wave directly outwards from the event. As a result, these waves travel in all directions, including downwards. It means that P waves can be detected on the other side of the world after the wave has actually travelled through all the layers of rock in between. Because the wave is a compression wave, the speed at which it travels from one particle of rock to another is dependent on what the rock, or even the liquid, is actually made from. So measuring how quickly a P wave travels through the different layers of the Earth, you can calculate what the various layers might actually be made from. These compression waves are the same basic principle that rattle your windows during a thunderstorm and used to detect the explosion of an underground nuclear device. The nuclear test generally lacks the S waves that normally accompany an earthquake. However, whilst P waves are fast moving, they don't normally cause much damage and can give an advance warning for about a minute before more damaging waves from the earthquake could strike. We have S waves or secondary waves just shear waves, a kind of ripple effect, like when you rapidly move a towel up and down. The particles move up and down on the spot, whilst the wavefront moves forward. Again, like P waves, these waves travel out in all directions from the source. Because this type of wave relies upon each particle sticking to its neighbour in order to move up and down together to form the wave, the wave really can't travel well through air or liquid. When detectors on the opposite side of the Earth to an earthquake readily detect P waves, however, they fail to detect S waves. This kind of large shadowed area on the opposite side of the Earth to an earthquake is why scientists think that the core of the Earth is molten, so a liquid or a semi liquid core would lack the ability to convey the S waves through it. Love waves are surface waves, or at least considering the size of the Earth, waves that don't go too deep into the interior of the Earth. Like S waves, these again are a form of shear wave, except this time particles responsible for transmitting the wave move laterally from side to side rather than up and down. Additionally, the closer the particles are to the surface, the more they move, the oscillation decreasing with depth. The destructive element of the love waves is fairly dependent upon how deep the origin of the earthquake was. So generally, the deep earthquakes generate far smaller love waves than the shallow ones. Most of the actual rocking movement that people detect during an earthquake is actually the result of the love waves. In a shallow earthquake, the love waves can travel a considerable distance out from the epicenter of the earthquake and so can result in fairly widespread damage. It leaves us with the slowest moving and rather odd Raleigh waves. However, the Raleigh waves are really only odd in the fact they're moving through a solid rather than a liquid. So the movement of the particles in a Raleigh wave are the same that's involved in creating waves in an ocean. The Raleigh wave, the particles move in a small circle. The closer the epicenter or the larger the magnitude of the earthquake, the larger the circular movement is. This circular movement then creates a ripple-like wave on the surface, this rising and falling on the ground, which can cause major damage close to the epicentre of the earthquake, 
especially again if the earthquake is fairly shallow. The Earth, however, isn't the only place that can suffer the effects of quakes. The Moon regularly has significant quakes, but not quite on the same scale as those on the Earth. However, since the Moon lacks surface water or liquid core, there's little to dampen the effects of these quakes. It means that quakes on the Moon can actually last for over an hour. Now, if humans eventually build structures on other planets, especially those without liquid uh, water on them, the risks really could be quite serious from quakes, especially since cracks in the structure created by the quakes could be terminal for those people actually living inside those buildings.